All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, as we are probably all aware at this point, Father's Day is coming up next week, and I'm really looking forward to Father's Day. I'm really looking forward to the, the barbecue that we're gonna have going on at the Fireweed property. Um, but because Father's Day is coming up next Sunday, I wanted to take the time today to uh, look at the nature of God the Father, at least part of his nature. So um, naturally, uh, today's sermon title is Our Father, the Disciplinarian, uh-oh. <laughs> I know, I could have talked about our loving Father, our gracious Father, our merciful Father, our awesome Father. No, no, our Father, the Disciplinarian, uh-oh. Because um, let's face it, there are, I think, four things that we just don't talk about in church these days anymore. I mean, we certainly don't talk about, you know, God being a, you know, in you know, charge of punishment or being a disciplinarian. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about sin. We don't do that. We don't talk about hell. And we don't talk about Bruno. I'm sorry, I had to put that in there for the kids. That was, okay. All right. Anyway, but we need to talk about our Father in heaven and being a disciplinarian, why is he a disciplinarian? How is he a disciplinarian? Uh, and why actually this is a good thing that he is a disciplinarian. And so that's what we're going to do today. And so for the text, if you would go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to be going through verses uh, 4 through 11. If you don't have your Bible with you, it is going to be up here. And uh, in case you're wondering, in case your Bible reads a little bit differently than up here, that's because I'm using the 1995 NASB. I tried to update, but you know, I just, I, no, couldn't anymore. Nothing wrong with the new NASB. It's just, you know, after you start memorizing verses in one version, it's like, do I have to switch again? I remember going from the NIV to the NASB. It's tough enough. So anyway, Hebrews chapter 12 verses 4 through 11. And give me one second here because as I'm just starting to get up there, I know I need some visual aids here, so I've got them. All right, beginning in verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons." Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness." So we're going to be going through five points today um, about God being a disciplinarian that we're going to take right out of the text, and then five applications. It's a get five, get, uh, and then get five more free sale, I guess, today. Um, but uh, as we go through the text, um, I, you know, I, I know that when it comes to our Father in heaven, for some people that's a difficult term. That's a difficult thing to, to come to terms with, that we have a good, good father in heaven. Because some of, some of us may have been raised with a father who was not a good, good father on earth. Maybe we didn't have a father in our home. I was blessed to have a, a pretty good father in my home. Not perfect, but a pretty good father. I'd like to think I'm a pretty good father to my kids, but, uh, you know, testimony time later for Hannah if she wants to share. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, some of us grew up without a father, with a father who we might prefer to have not had. So sometimes it's a stretch for some of us to come to the realization there is a good father, a good heavenly father out there. And certainly when we come with the theme of our father being a disciplinarian, already for some people I know that's like, ugh, ah, uncomfortable. Because 
of my own history with my dad. So I hope that today this message can clear up and explain some things about what it means to have a good father in heaven who disciplines us and what that may look like. So point number one, we find this in verse seven in the very first part where it says here that it is for discipline that you endure. The thing is, is that we endure difficult times because we are being disciplined. Now, I know that saying that at first, at first blush, that's very hard to accept. Well, what, what do you mean because I'm going through tough times? You, am I being punished? What's going on? Is that what you're saying? That doesn't sound biblical. That doesn't sound scriptural. But hear me out. Hear me out. I think what makes this statement, we endure difficult times because we're being disciplined. What makes it so difficult to accept is our misunderstanding of the word discipline. We often will use it as being synonymous with punishment. If I look at my kids and, you know, well, Ari's not in here right now. Hannah, do you need some discipline right now? Yeah, see, she's already shaking her head. No, she does not want any discipline right now. Because we think of it as being punishment. And the thing is that that definition isn't wrong. It's just not enough. There's more to discipline than just punishment. Verse 6 does mention scourging. Scourging, you know, that's, that's part of discipline. But it's not a complete definition of discipline. So think about some of the other times that we use the word discipline even in the English language and in a more positive light. Think of some of the, uh, for example, military. In the military, you, if you are in the military, you want to be part of a military that is disciplined. In the military, each soldier must be disciplined because they need to have cohesion with their unit. And the unit needs to be disciplined because it needs to have cohesion with other units. And those units need to have cohesion with bigger units yet. If there is no discipline along the line, there is chaos. You know, I, I know that we often as Americans make fun of the British during the Revolutionary War. Ha <laughs> ha, what are those idiots doing marching around those bright red coats and line up in a straight line, okay. Meanwhile, we're hiding behind trees and rocks and picking them off one by one, right? Well, there's an element of truth to that, but have you ever wondered why the British kept beating us so badly, especially at the beginning of the Revolutionary War? Yeah, we had our fair share, of, you know, we had, a, we had some battles, one here and there, but if it was a matter of the British and the Americans, you know, early on the colonials and, you know, lining up, doing battle, the British were having a heyday. Discipline was why. You see, there was a reason that the British would march in those lines and they'd all line up. There was a reason why they would wear red so they could pick each other out in the battlefield and, well, it was also economic. Red was the cheapest color that they could, that they could use, the cheapest dye, so. But, um... And there was a reason, the reason that they lined up in straight lines and all fired together and stayed together was because of the weaponry that they had. And uh, what they had were muskets, which were extremely inaccurate. They didn't have any, any rifling in the barrel. Like today, rifles have rifling in the barrel so that uh, there's rotation on the bullet. It's accurate. Muskets weren't accurate. Any, do we have any baseball pitchers in here? Yes. You ever try to throw a knuckleball? Uh, yeah. yeah, how accurate is it? Uh, yeah, no rotation on the ball. You can't really control where it goes. You just kind of hurl it up there and... Shoo. On the other hand, if I put rotation on a baseball, like a fastball, curveball, I can have more accuracy with, with what I'm doing. So what am I getting at? The British were disciplined. They knew if they, when they stuck together on the field of battle and they fired, and if while they're standing, they're reloading their muskets, they're getting ready for the next round to go off, uh, you know, to, uh, excuse me, to be able to fire their next round, they knew that they could wear out the enemy and eventually take them down. So the idea of us being able to you know, snipe at them from behind trees and rocks all the time, <laughs> well, every now and then, but as a general rule of thumb, it didn't always work out so well. So in the military, it's important to be disciplined. Athletes, athletes need to be disciplined. 
Lately in the news, we've seen some pretty ill-disciplined athletes, right? Antonio Brown. Um, but uh, not that I want to name names or anything. <clears throat> um, but athletes need to be disciplined. You guys are from Texas, right? Nolan Ryan, 5,714 strikeouts, strikeout leader, played for both the Astros and the and the uh, um, and the Texas Rangers. And you know, he was a pitcher until he was 46 years old. That's old in the major leagues. He spent 27 years, 27 seasons. And there was a reason for that. He was disciplined. His pitching coach, Tom House, used to say Nolan Ryan was the most disciplined pitcher he ever saw. He was throwing 98 miles per hour at age 46 before he retired. That's fast for anybody, let alone a 46-year-old. And then, of course, disciplined children. As a father, it's important for me to have disciplined children. But it's not just important for me, it's important for the children too. If the children are undisciplined, they lose. So the word that's used here, the Greek word, is based off, and the reason I say based off is because when you see the word discipline here in chapter 12, it's different variations off of this particular word, but it's based on the Greek word uh, paiduo. So sometimes you might see paideas, paideon, paide, uh, paide this, paide that. Um, but uh, paiduo is the uh, Greek word it's based off of, and it means instruction, tutorage, particularly when it comes to children. Chastening and punishing are in there as well. But it's this idea of, imagine this, raising up a child the way that he should go. So when he's older, he's going to follow it. That's the idea behind discipline. We saw this same word, if you remember, uh, some time back, those of you that were here, not in Texas, um, when I was preaching on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That word training is the same word. So you can just as easily use the word paiduo, uh, excuse me, to mean training, to mean instruction, to mean tutorage. Um, if you're a musician, eventually in the future you might take a pedagogy class. And a pedagogy class is a class where you have a bunch of different musical instruments in one family in front of you and you learn, you get training on how to play each of those instruments. So there's brass pedagogy, woodwind pedagogy, string pedagogy, etc. So I took a couple pedagogy classes when I was in, when I was in college. And um, in these days there were people called pedagogues and what they were were they were teachers. And they were teachers that were specifically hired, sometimes they were slaves, and they were brought in specifically to teach rich sons and instruct them along the way so that they could learn how to eventually become good men in uh, Roman and or Greek society. They were called pedagogues. So the idea of we endure difficult times because we are being disciplined has a totally different connotation when we think about discipline in that light of instruction, of tutorage, sometimes punishing. Think about... I think, when I think of, of this sort of thing, of enduring tough things, I think of Job. I think of the book of Job. And when you think about what happened to Job, you realize that the horrible things that Job endured were allowed by God to take place so that God could discipline him. But was Job punished for doing anything wrong? No. But was he instructed? Was he taught? And then in the end, blessed more than the cursing, if you will, that happened before. If Job hadn't gone through those difficult things, he would not have received the blessing of being disciplined by God. Second point. We are being disciplined because we are children of God. We see this in verses 7 and 8. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. 
See, fathers care enough about their children, or they should anyway, that they look out for their welfare. Fathers want to instruct and train and correct their children because we're control freaks. No, it's because we want our children to grow up to be even better than we are. At least that's the way it should be, ideally. It isn't always that way. Do you realize there is an entire book of the Bible that's dedicated to this kind of discipline? It's called Proverbs. How many times in the first chapter do we say, this is for, do we hear, this is for wisdom and instruction? And further on, who is Solomon addressing this to? My son. Pay attention to my words. My son. Listen to my wisdom. My son. This is my instruction. He's teaching his kid. If it was Rehoboam, then he didn't listen too well, did he? Those of you that know the story, well, never mind. I won't get into the story right now. The sermon will take a while, but... Um, But the book of Proverbs, if you want a book of discipline, go to the book of Proverbs. 31 chapters of discipline. Go for it. Um, The the thing is, is that if you're in a place or if somebody else is in a place where you're not feeling God's discipline in your life, maybe, maybe you need to check to see if you're one of God's children. Now, Probably a lot of us are going through good times. I'm just kind of curious. How many of us right now are going through a difficult time in one way or another? I am. I'm going through some challenges. Mm-hmm. If you're not, get out. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't, <laughs> don't leave. If you're not, you need to be here. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's if you're not being disciplined by God, or if you're not subjecting yourself to his discipline, you may actually be an illegitimate child. No, I'm not going to say the B word. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) But you may be an illegitimate child. You know, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus once called, uh, uh, he called out to, uh, to some of the Jews that were around him, you are of your father, the devil. And you know, the astonishing thing in this passage to me is that earlier in verse 32, these people were labeled as, quote, Jews who had believed him. And then a few verses later, he's saying, you're of your father, the devil, which they did not take kindly to. Um, Apparently, whatever faith they had in Jesus when they believed him, apparently it wasn't a saving faith. Apparently they were not legitimate children of God. And Jesus called them out for it because they did not, as Jesus told them, continue in his word. You know what we find them doing in verse 58 of that chapter? They're trying to stone Jesus. Especially when he says, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, then they're, nope, they're not believing him anymore. Nope, they're picking up those rocks and they're ready to go to town. So it's possible among a group of people that are largely believers, it's possible to have people in your midst who are actually not children of God, but they're illegitimate children. Now, if you're concerned about that for yourself or or for somebody else that you happen to hang in there, okay, there's, we're going to address that later on. Point number three, we need to subject ourselves to our father's discipline. Why? Because our Father is also our King. It's important to obey your Father anyway. At least most of the time. No, no, all the time. Pretty much. <laughs> as long as your earthly Father is not, you know, going against your heavenly Father. Let's put it that way. It's, it's important to obey your earthly Father. It's more important to obey your heavenly Father because think about it. Your heavenly Dad is also the King of the universe. This is one of the most amazing things about our relationship, I think, with God. He is king of the universe. He rules all. He is the great sovereign. And yet, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, and especially if you think about it in either Aramaic or Hebrew, that term, our father there, Avinu, it's sort of more based off of that term, Abba. Jesus liked to call his father Abba a lot, which is more informal. It's like saying dad or Daddy, we're allowed to call the king of the universe dad. But he's still king. 
When we subject ourselves to our Father's discipline, we are engaged in worship. Because the definition of worship in and of itself is bowing down before a king. God, I understand you're king, I'm servant, and I need to, I, I need to subject myself to your authority. So when you find yourself in difficult circumstances, you endure those circumstances, you grow through those circumstances, you look to God in those circumstances because, among other things, it is an act of worship. You are showing that you believe that God is the one in charge. It's his authority that matters. So we've gone over three points. We endure difficult times because we are being disciplined. We're being disciplined because we're children of God. And we need to subject ourselves to our Father's discipline. Point number four, the Father disciplines us for our good so we may share in his holiness. Let's go over verse 10. Verse 10 says, For they, and this is the earthly fathers, for they disciplined us uh, for a short time as seemed best to them, but he our Heavenly Father, disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. All right, now is the time where I get to talk about, uh, where I get to talk about disciplining Hannah. This week I had the pleasure of disciplining my daughter. You're wondering what she did wrong. I'm going to tell you. Nothing. She didn't do a thing wrong. She didn't do a thing wrong. No. Basically, I knew that, you know, uh, Hannah needed a little bit of a lesson in, in cooking. And uh, so I decided to introduce her to what I think, honestly, okay, gentlemen, if you're going to go to college and, you know, eventually, you know, get married, that sort of thing. Okay, listen up, okay? This is one of the handiest tools you can use in the kitchen. Super cheap, too, okay? And, and often a little bit more impressive, okay, than, like, cooking ramen. Um, <laughs> two words, crock pot, Okay? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Learn how to use it. It's super easy. Okay? Most of the time, prep time is just down. Hannah, easy? Comparatively? Use a crock pot? Yeah. Are you broke down? Yeah. Well, that was the old one, yes. <laughs> we got everything all prepped up and ready to go. Got all the things. That, you know what she made in the crock pot? Stuffed green bell peppers. Yeah. Beef, rice, mozzarella on top. Yeah. Yeah, they were good. <laughs> They were good. I had my doubts. I thought they were going to be too mushy. Yeah, no, no, they're just. Um, but yeah, she chose the recipe. We went to the store. We we bought the we bought what we needed uh, in order for her to make the recipe. We stopped off at the pet store, which she was very happy about because um, those of you that know Hannah know that she's got this thing for tarantulas. So uh, yeah, got got to hold a tarantula. You know, which is good. And. Uh, <laughs> good for you. So. Uh, anyway, so, and then after that, you know, we got home, we, and, and she cooked the, cooked the meal in the crock pot. I disciplined her. I instructed her. I tutored her. Led the way for her. Why? Because I thought, that's a pretty good, important skill to have. If you're just kind of learning, you're trying to find your way around the kitchen and do something just a little bit more than ramen. Um, <laughs> crock pot, it's a good way to go. I taught her because I saw something that I thought would be good for her. In God's case, he knows what's good for us. We earthly fathers, we're, we're guessing. We make very educated guesses, but we are guessing. With God, he doesn't guess. He knows what's good for us. When he disciplines us, when he instructs us, when he tutors us, even when he punishes us, it is for our good. And it's so we may share in his holiness. You know, whenever the Father is disciplining us for good, there is always a sin issue involved. Now hang with me, okay? It does not mean that you committed a sin and he's getting back at you. No, Jesus paid for sins on the cross. The justice has already been served. That's not, no, that's not, and we don't, we don't do the purgatory thing, right? That's not us. So, yes, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I know you like hot things, but oh, purgatory, no. Um, so, when God 
disciplines us, there's always a sin issue involved. But it may, it may be because you sinned, you messed up, and you know he needs to do something, make something tough happen in your life so that you understand, not the way to go. I've had that happen to me. I've endured tough times because I was at fault. It does happen. So I have, I've definitely had correction in my life of that kind. But sometimes the issue is one of God wanting to prevent sin from happening in your life. God wanting you to trust him more so that you're trusting in the world less or you're trusting in whatever you trust in less and you trust in him more so that you can share in his holiness. You can be set apart to him. You can work on, big theological term, sanctification. Discipline's important. Worship, that's big. Sanctification, that's huge. Consider what's described in the previous chapter. We're in chapter 12, but if you go into chapter 11, oh yeah, we got the Hall of Fame of Faith. And then we go down to, you know, this passage down here. Others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Wow, let's put that up for a recruiting poster for Jesus. <laughs> that passage there is in the chapter before, among other reasons, because what the author of Hebrews says in verse 4, he says, now, you guys, you haven't even resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Nobody has died in that particular community. They haven't gone that far. And yet they're having trouble dealing with enduring tough times. And you know what? I, I mean, I, I can't blame them. I have trouble enduring tough times. I don't like it. I don't like even little tiny tough, tough times. But what the author of Hebrews is saying is that when you go through those tough times... It's so we become more like him. We are called to be holy even as God is holy. We're supposed to be set apart from the world to him. When the world looks at us, they should see something different, something weird, something is not quite right. We may be able to blend in a little bit with our clothes. We may be able to blend in a little bit, you know, with the language that we speak. Not coarse language, mind you, but, you know, speaking the language, we kind of blend in. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. The world should be able to know. Being disciplined, enduring tough times, and allowing, uh, being subject to that discipline that God gives us, allows us to work on our holiness and to be set apart for him. James elaborates on this when he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Okay, that's um, simple. Uh, that's not easy. <laughs> Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's in James, the first chapter, verses 2 through 4. Being subjected to discipline, being subjected to tough times, helps us to become complete in Christ. Sanctification. Fifth point, even though discipline is painful in the moment, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So going down to verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. It's hard when we're being disciplined by God. It's hard when we're going through tough times to be joyful about it. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You know, it, it's, does anyone think it's a little bit odd that in Psalm 23, in verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Anybody else think that's just a little weird? 
Just, just, just a little? <laughs> so here's the thing about the rod and the staff. Okay? The rod was kind of like a shorter, almost a club uh, like thing, or maybe like a mini baseball bat. <laughs> they didn't have baseball in those days, though. Um, but it was used for a couple different things. One was if a wolf got into the, the flock, that was usually the first weapon because it was pretty easy and quick to wield and whack, you know, you could, you know, whack a, a, a wolf or lion. Um, the other thing it was used for was sometimes you'd use it to prod a sheep. Hey, get, my, get, get going the right way there. Yeah, every now and then if a sheep was being particularly ornery, doggone ram, a little whack. But a rod was basically used to get the sheep going in the right direction. You've been in the field too long. You're not following my directions here. This isn't good for you to stay here. So you gonna get going there? Come on, Fluffy. Get, no, okay, you know, and get the sheep going, get him moving, or her moving. Um, the staff could also be used to fight wild animals if it needed to, especially if you needed to hold them out at a longer distance. And often the staff would have a, kind of a crook at the end. So many of you have probably seen pictures of uh, Roman Catholic or Orthodox bishops or even, uh, even the Pope uh, himself has what's uh, called a shepherd's, I want to say miter. I want to say it's the miter. I could be wrong on that one. Anyway, the point is that he carries the staff with him that has an elaborate crook on the end. Why? Well, because that crook was used often for two things. One, you got this sheep wandering off in that direction. Oh, no, 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 no. Eh, yeah, and you'd bring him on in. Or sheep falls off of a, of a ravine or something and is, you know, hanging. Ah, bah, bah. How am I going to pull him back up? Well, it's a good thing I got this handy staff. You're in the, you'd pull the sheep out of a dangerous situation. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why? They're keeping me safe. They're keeping me where I need to be. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When we're going through difficult times, the rod and the staff of our Heavenly Father can be very comforting through those times, even though they're tough. Now, most of you probably know that I've been part of Celebrate Recovery for a long time. And the thing is that there's a particular line in the serenity prayer that really, really helped me. Because I'll just testify that a person that is engaged in addictions of any kind is usually trying to find a way to numb pain. There's some way, I, I'm in a situation, I don't like it, I need to find some way to dull the pain, numb the pain. And one line from the serenity prayer that really helped was this one. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. That sounds so easy. That sounds simple, excuse me, but it's not easy to do. To look at your difficult circumstances and say, this is the way I know that I, I'm going through these tough times, and yet this is the way to peace. Not trying to avoid it, not trying to get out of it, not trying to skirt around it or, or, or cheat the rules, but going through the hardship because you know that you're being tested. You know that your character needs to grow. You know that that's what the Lord has in store for you. Accepting hardship is a pathway to peace. Now, when it comes to bearing fruit, that's pretty important. Matthew 3.8 uh, John the Baptist is talking to the Pharisees and he's scolding them for a while and then he tells them, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then a couple verses later he yells at them, hey, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. You shall know a tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. That part John the Baptist didn't say, by the way, that was Jesus later on. So, if you want to bear fruit for the Lord, when you go through those tough times and you realize you're going through the discipline of the Lord, subject yourself to the discipline because the end result is going to be you will bear fruit. And you want to bear fruit. 
If you're not bearing fruit, there is a problem there. Think about it this way, though. If I take some gold ore and I put it through very intense heat in a, in a process, but a lot of heat, what happens to that gold? It gets purified. Dross gets burned off. The gold becomes pure, but it's got to go through a lot of heat first. If I take a lot of carbon and I put that carbon under immense pressure, you can form diamonds. But the carbon has to go through a lot of pressure in order to come out as diamonds. Maybe you're under a lot of pressure right now because your carbon... And God's trying to turn you into a very, very precious, very useful jewel. Now, I mentioned Job earlier. Consider Job's fruit. He endured some horrendous things. But the fruit that came from Job is fruit we still enjoy today. The guy's got a book named after him for crying out loud. If Job's trials and the discipline he went through, if he had rejected that, if he had gone along his wife's way, and if he had decided either to end his life or just to reject God in the process, not only would he not have had the blessing at the end, not only would he not have been strengthened, but we today would not have been blessed with his story, with his testimony, with that entire book of the Bible that we can look at. Now, we can look at today when we go through tough times and we can say, all right, there is suffering on the earth and there is a light at the end. In our case, we happen to know that light is Christ. All right, let's go through the five applications. Application number one. Now, all these applications are going to come right from chapter 12. And I have to tell you, if I had been thinking of applications, some of these would not have been what I would have come up with on my own because they seem a little bit uh, strange. I, I would have come up with different stuff. Ah, that's probably why scriptures are good. Ah, anyway, first application comes out of verse one. Lay aside every encumbrance and sin. When we had that sermon series a while ago on the armor of God, and we were talking about how, you know, uh, uh, particularly the shoes had to be light. You, you needed to you know, be able to move in good footwear. Um, when you're encumbered, when you are encumbered with stuff, it is awfully hard to fight battles. Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You need to lay aside the sin. You need to go through a renewing of the mind. You need to lay aside those things that, that hurt, that keep you back, that are encumbrances. Part of being in Celebrate Recovery again, and I've gone through the process three times, is doing what's called a spiritual inventory. We do them in step four. Doing a spiritual inventory is not fun. You basically end up, if you ever do one, you, uh, in the case of CR, there are five questions, and you're answering these questions, and you're basically listing out everything in your life that has had a significant impact and everybody that has had a significant impact, particularly those things that have hurt me. Um, just about everything I listed, there was a sin issue where either I had sinned or somebody else had sinned. We often talk about in CR about dealing with hurts, habits, and hangups. And when I did my spiritual inventory, especially the first couple times, going through those particular events and thinking about those particular people, it was almost like reliving the moment. It's a very emotional experience. But it was stuff that I have to say, you know, as a Christian, I hadn't dealt with a lot of those issues yet. Some of them were way back 
and they were coming to light as I was doing my inventory. I just want to ask you now, I'm not saying everybody in here has to do a spiritual inventory. You don't have to use Celebrate Recovery's format. But I will tell you this, there is power in seeing things like that when they are written down and when you are facing them and you're saying, oh, wow. One, you begin to realize, huh, I'm really not a good person after all. Which, quite frankly, as Christians, we should come to that conclusion anyway when we come to the cross. Nope, not good. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? None of us are good. There's none righteous, no, not one. The spiritual inventory confirms that for you. If you're not using a spiritual inventory, though, what are you using in order to lay aside your encumbrances and to lay aside your sins? What are you doing? If you don't have some sort of tool for working with that, I highly encourage it. But I'll tell you this as well. If you're going to do anything like a spiritual inventory or laying aside every encumbrance in sin, there is one thing you definitely have to have with you to make it effective. You have to have somebody else walk alongside you. You need an accountability partner because they will keep you on the straight and narrow when it comes to this and sometimes call you out if you're missing some things as you're writing them down. Lay aside every encumbrance in sin. I can testify before you right now. That is not easy to do. It's hard work. Yes, there were tears. Okay, guys, I'll just admit to it. Okay, there were times I cried. All right, okay. Um, but there is something so brilliant at the end of it. It's hard to describe. It's a, just a freedom, an absolute freedom when you get through your inventory. And then you realize after you've done one, my gosh, I think there's more that I'll have to do on the next inventory. So it's like peeling back layers of an onion. Of course, you know what happens when you peel back each layer of an onion? You cry. Um, all right, second application. First one is lay aside every encumbrance and sin. Second is found in verses 2 and 3. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? Why do we want to do that? Well, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who saw it all. You think you've got tough times? Try being nailed to a cross. Don't actually try that. That's not a piece of advice. He was beaten, he was scourged, he was put on the cross, he was humiliated. His clothes were taken from him. He went through the whole 10 yards. Crucifixion was not fun. Do you think he understands what it's like to suffer? How many other faiths around the world can make the claim, my God knows what it's like to suffer as we suffer? And to do it to such a degree, to experience suffering to such a degree that we're just blown away by what happened to him. That high priest can come alongside us when we're going through what we go through, which is genuine hard stuff, but he can come alongside us and he says, I, yeah, I know what it's like to suffer. I'm going to walk with you on this. Isn't that comforting? Lay aside every encumbrance and sin. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Number three for applications. Strengthen what is weak and make crooked paths straight. We get this from verse 12 in chapter 12. It's the next verse down. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak, the knees that are feeble. Oh, in verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Now, I happen to believe that since Hebrews was written to a group of believers, that this is not just written uh, as an individual um, in encouragement to do. This is also written corporately. Strengthen what is weak. Make crooked paths straight. When we see, first of all, when we are struggling individually, then we need to 
take care of, if there's something about our lives that is weak, we need to acknowledge that, and if it can be strengthened, to strengthen it. Now, sometimes we have limbs that are lame, okay? In my life, I know that there are certain weaknesses that I have that I just should not touch with a 10-foot pole. I just shouldn't go there. For those that struggle with, as, as an example, not for me, but, you know, for, for other people out there, for those that happen to struggle with, with alcoholism, many of them come back and they say, I cannot take a single drink of alcohol, not a drop, not anymore. Can't do it. It's kind of like having a lame limb. It's going to stay lame. Can, now, is God capable of healing that? Absolutely. Not going to be the one to put God in a box. But does he always? No. Sometimes he keeps the lame lame and the blind blind. Sometimes he heals. Sometimes he doesn't. At least not in that way. Not now. In eternity, it's not going to be an issue. Corporately, we need to help those that are weak. If we can strengthen them through helping them in the body, great. If we know that, we, that they have a, a, a limb that is lame, then we don't want to put an obstacle in their path. We want to keep the road clear. We want to keep the running track clear. Application number four, pursue peace with all men and sanctification. This comes from verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 12, he says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. There's a lot of slander that's going on right now for Christians in, in America. It's not as bad as other places in the world. We've still got it pretty good here. But I think we've all noticed there, there are winds of change that have come. And there are some pretty nasty things said. Now, if we're talking about Christian leaders that have done terrible things, that, that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay, if a Christian leader has done terrible things, then that's not slander. <laughs> But if all Christians are accused of doing something or being a certain way, and they're not that way, then that is, that is slander. How do we combat that? How do we fight that? By keeping our behavior excellent among the unbelievers. So that they can see actual evidence we're not so bad. However, when we're trying to get along with everybody and, you know, have peace with everybody, we should never do it at the cost of sanctification, of drawing close to God. I just saw a great example this week. I don't know how many of you have followed this, but, um, okay, as we know, June is uh, Pride Month in America, okay? The Tampa Bay Rays baseball team uh, for June... They uh, came decked out in, with numbers that had the colors of the rainbow on them in support of Pride Month, except for five players on the Tampa Bay Rays team who refused to wear the numbers. They called a press conference, and they basically told the public, they said, um, basically because of our faith, we are choosing not to wear the colors for, of the rainbow for Pride Month, because we don't condone that particular lifestyle. If you want to come and come to our games, you are more than welcome. We love having you here. We love having you cheer for the Rays. Uh, yeah, you are more than welcome, and we're going to make you feel welcome to come here, but we can't agree with you on this. So they chose to just keep their uniforms the same original uniforms. Well, so far... A little bit of flack, but even among the LGBTQ community, there's a lot of support for these gentlemen because they showed integrity and because they didn't spew hate. They just said, hey, this is going against what we stand for. We can't support it, but we love having you here. 
it's a hard balance, isn't it? To be able to say to somebody, I love you, but I don't agree with you. I love you, but you're wrong. <laughs> That's tough. That's a tough one. Because, you know, let's face it, sometimes the other person just doesn't believe you. And how much control do you have over that? But you can control how much you love somebody else. Pursue peace with all men and sanctification. I think that's exactly what those five men on the Tampa Bay Rays did. Fifth application, see to it that no one comes short of God's grace. Verses 15 through 17 in the second chapter say this, see too that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Um, the root of bitterness is something that I don't want to go into a lot of detail about, but I believe we've seen that in this particular body of believers. We've gone through some tough times as a church, and um, we've had people leave. We've had a lot of people leave. And really at the heart of it all was some bitterness. Bitterness is dangerous in church. Anger Okay, we can deal with anger. We can, you know, we'll, we, we can work it out. Beatles, right? Um, but as soon as the anger takes root and it becomes bitterness, it has the potential to destroy relationships. Bitterness, how many of, of you have seen bitterness destroy a local congregation? Just absolutely, it almost did here. Almost did here. Thankfully, we've, we've got some strong people here. We've got a strong core here. But, yeah, most of us, if not all of us, have heard of some church that bitterness was what ended up destroying the church or, or splitting the church. It's easy to become bitter when you're enduring hardship. When you're going through trials, when you're going through the discipline of the Lord, if you're not subjecting yourself to the Lord's uh, sovereignty, and to his discipline, it's very easy to become bitter in your circumstances. It's especially easy if you are in a Christian church and you start going through tough times, but you yourself are not actually a believer. And then you get to hear all the nice little platitudes that Christians say to one another. It's okay, God has this under control. That's true, you know. It's all right, God will be with you, that, that's true. But if a person's not actually walking with God, if they don't actually have faith in God, if they don't have faith in Jesus Christ, it's all just nice platitudes and it doesn't amount to anything. It's easy to become in, bitter when enduring hardship. It's easy enough for us as believers in Christ, let alone those who do not believe in Christ. Part of what can uh, define or, or help to point out somebody that is not a believer, somebody who is coming short of the grace of God, is apparently immorality and godlessness. You know, the thing is that sometimes wolves will sneak in among the sheep. There's a difference, and as leaders we see it, there, there is a difference between a wolf coming in among the flock and an unbeliever coming in. A wolf is coming in to do damage. A wolf is often going to say all the right things. A wolf is going to try to disguise him or herself as a sheep. They're going to try to look like a sheep, act like a sheep, and then they're going to try to pick off the flock. They're going to try to do damage. Wolves often just need to be chased away. And it's very painful to do. Because we don't want to label somebody as a wolf, but I'll tell you something. Especially now that now that I'm uh, now that I've got a, a pastor internship here, one thing that I'm finding that 
is bothering more, me more and more as time goes on is when I hear certain teachers teaching absolutely false doctrine. And they are fleecing their flock with it. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, oh, he's a wolf. Because <laughs> if I said other words, you know, then uh, you know, I might not be pastor intern for very long. Um, but that's wolves. What about other illegitimate children? What about others? You know, we talked about illegitimate children earlier. What about those who are among us? They've been part of church all their lives, but they just haven't come to faith in Christ. Well, here's the wonderful thing about God's family. Usually when we talk about illegitimate children, we're talking about a birth issue. And I know we, you know, we say, well, there are no such thing as illegitimate children, just illegitimate parents, right? But when we're talking about spiritually illegitimate children, here's the wonderful thing. Every child of God is adopted. We are adopted into the family of God. That means an illegitimate child can become a true child of God. You just need faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. <coughs> so here's what I'm going to conclude with today. Um, because I, I, you know, I like doing this. I think systematic theology is, is really important. I think it's really important as a church. And so I wanted to go over um, what the Baptist faith and message has to say about God being our Father. So I think we're, we're going to get it up here soon. But here's the, here's the passage from the Baptist faith and message. God as Father reigns with providential care over his universe, his creatures, and the flow of the stream of human history according to the purposes of his grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all loving and all wise. God is Father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is fatherly in his attitude toward all men. This is our Father in heaven. And when we say he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all loving, and he is all wise, he uses his power, his knowledge, his love, and his wisdom. And one thing that he does is he disciplines us. And the discipline is good. It grows us. It makes us stronger. It's hard in the moment. It's not joyful. It doesn't feel joyful. It's sorrowful. We actually have to proactively be joyful in that moment. Well, maybe today's message is foreign for you because you're hearing about a father who's wonderful, he's loving, he knows how to show love to his children, but you haven't experienced that with an earthly father. Maybe you've had negative experiences with, a, with an earthly father, with a stepfather, maybe with a mother's boyfriend. And that's left, left you pretty cynical and pretty jaded about having a good heavenly father. And you may not be convinced of this today, in just one sermon. But I do want to let you know, I want to testify to you, you do have a loving, heavenly father. He's a father. He shows his kids how much he loves them through disciplining us. He knows that discipline is what helps us grow into the men and the women that God wants us to become. And then God, in addition to disciplining He's demonstrated his love in a different way, hasn't he? Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we were good. Not because we were on his side. We were enemies. We were at enmity with God. And it was at that moment that God sends Jesus to the cross. I love you where you are now. Warts and all. Nobody has warts, right? Okay, okay, good, just checking. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I don't know who in here is a legitimate, true child of God, and who in here may be an illegitimate child. Maybe you didn't even realize it until today. 
But I want you to know today you have a loving heavenly father and he's demonstrated his love already through the cross. He sent Jesus to the cross while you're still a bad person. That's why I love Christianity so much. This is a, this is a religion, this is a faith for the bad people. <laughs> Can't take righteous people here. Well, until you get in and then you become righteous, but it's because of what he did, not, not through what we do. Maybe today is the day when you need to surrender to your heavenly father, when you need to become subject to him, when you need to lay your sin, your nature at his feet, and when you need to cry out to him for salvation. He loves you. He is willing, he's ready, he's able to give that to you today, this very hour.